Once in a while, I will take a good look at all the tools I'm using and find some ways to use it better in a faster way. And a text editor, I think, is so integral to the work I do with, say, the Internet of Things technologies. So today I want to share about a text editor, which is VS Code. And for the past few months, I've been slowly doing all kinds of stuff in VS Code. Now, traditionally, I had this impression that VS Code is especially suited for any kind of web development using JavaScript. You can probably also stretch it to server development for, say, Docker files, uh, bash files, server management stuff. But it's only recently, these past few weeks, that I found VS Code to also use it for microcontrollers, even single board computers with C, C++ languages. And you can say that, yes, I'm liking the fact that I finally have like one text editor to do all kinds of technologies and programming configurations. But at the same time, and I will explain how, I'm also struggling a little bit in the sense that I think I haven't gotten some things right, uh, some things are not working. And again, at the same time, I'm also tweaking my settings constantly and trying to customize them and see how I can do things better. Maybe the settings that I'm showing you today might not be the same a few months later. And this process of, you know, liking, customizing and tweaking and struggling at the same time is what I call sharpening the tools and it, that is completely fine. So in today's video, I want to share what I learned about VS Code text editor, especially with respect to how I'm using it with microcontrollers and even single board computers. So let's get started with nine tips with VS Code for embedded development. And tip number one is all about how to access the commands and files. So there are two handy commands. One is shift command P, which will open up a lot of different types of commands. And the one that I really did, the first thing is to install code command in the path. What this allows us to do is uh, we can simply press code in our command line and say the folder that you want to open in the text editor and then enter. It will open up the folder in the text editor of VS Code. The second one is command P, which will enable us to shift through the various files. So let me just open the panel with the files that are available in the folder that I opened, starting with the quintessential example of Blinky for Arduino. So here, if I do command P, I can simply open make file and the make file will be opened. Tip number two is all about using extensions. So let me open up the extension panel and I want to share the extensions I have, specifically the ones related to embedded development. Starting with this C, C++ one, it is the one that is maintained and developed by Microsoft themselves. There is also CMake and CMake Tools. There is also CPP Lint that I've been using. There is also Remote SSH uh, that I love to use for remote servers, including for single board computers such as BeagleBone or Raspberry Pi. And finally, there is, of course, Arduino, where you can flash and compile the code using this extension. So these are the ones that I have installed, but related to embedded development, there is also things like STM32, uh, which I have uh, not tried. There are also ones on ESP32, as well as the ever popular platform IO. So there are many, many extensions that we can explore. There is also one on MicroPython, in fact, uh, several of them, as well as MicroBit. Tip number three is all about the settings. So here we can search for the settings which are available in the UI version. And you can scroll through in this manner and also through the extensions, let's say for C, C++. It will give you a UI way of searching it. And I quite like it. It's pretty fast. But you can also go through the settings in the JSON format. So I'm going to open the default JSON settings. And here you have many settings and commands to look through. 
but I'm going to open the settings in JSON. And of course, I have a lot of them as commented, but uh, as I go through the examples, I will uncomment them. So in order to access the settings in the JSON format, it's simply command and then comma. So I want to go through one very common useful setting, which is the window title right here. And I've commented it. As you can see up here, it's just called settings.json, but let me enable it. And immediately you will see that the entire file path is given. And if I open my Blinky LED example, here also you'll see that it is on desktop in the folder Blinky Arduino. The other setting that I find useful is this called files default language active editor language. So I'm not going to enable it. And now notice if I want to create a new file, notice at the bottom, it will say plain text and I will probably have to manually change it to C or some other embedded programming related language. But once let's say this Blinky INO Arduino file is already open, if I enable this settings, notice what happens when I click for a new file, it will automatically be in C language. Once again, this is a very general tip that I have, but it is incredibly fun for me. So let me open up the settings once again. And this time I will go to the fonts. Where is it? Yep. Right here. Fonts family. I have chosen Fira code and font ligature is true. So I'm going to turn them on. So we might not notice any difference here or anything useful, but let me open up another example. And over here, notice there are some mathematical symbols. So let's say I want greater than or equal. Notice how it changes. Or let's say this equal is double equal or triple equal. So ligatures help us do that. So ligatures make it just so much prettier. And for me, this is uh, quite fun to work with. Tip number five is about formatting the code. So we will look at a Blinky example for Raspberry Pi Pico written in C. Let's try to paste some code here. And we will go to the Pico examples. Let's just for the sake of example, pick out this for loop here. I'm just going to copy it. So notice what happens. The indentation is off and you will probably have to do something manually. So let me undo it. And inside my settings, I will enable editor format on paste as true. So let me try to paste once again. And now when I do it, notice that the indentations are absolutely correct, but because it is formatting by its own format rules, you notice that the brackets are on a new line. Whereas for me, I like to put brackets exactly after the function name or the block name. Specifically, I like to use the Google C++ style guide. And I also found some tweaks to override the Google C++ style guide in case we need it. So I'm going to use this style. Uh, yes, it is largely based on Google, but you see my indentation is two. So in order to enable that, I'm going back to the settings.json and let me uncomment, which is CLang format fallback. And here I will say based on Google, but my indentation is two and column limit is zero. So let me just undo the paste again. And I am going to paste the for loop. This time notice when I pasted the brackets are on the same line. So I find this incredibly time saving just because I'm always cutting and pasting code either from other open source repositories or my other projects. Tip number three is about CPP lint. Now I already use CPP as part of my make file where I will run CPP lint on all my Arduino or other C files, but it will be handy to go through the CPP lint as I am coding as well. So once again, I'll go back to the settings.json and I will uncomment the CPP lint extensions. Let me just for the sake of demo will not comment to the INO file. So here you will not see any errors for CPP lint. And let me uncomment it. And we should start seeing the CPP lint. Yep, the errors. So one common one is this uh, copyright error. Maybe let me add on one more. And let's say this is something I always love to do to do make a blinky function. And after I made that comment, there will be another CPP lint error. This is also something I love to ignore. So I can simply Similarly, add on various CPP filters. So once I enable the copyright, you have to add 
a minus sign at the start to say that uh, to ignore it and also the readability to do and other stuff that you might come across. Now, when I come back, you see that the CPP lint errors are gone. Tip number seven is using IntelliSense. This is like a game changer for me. This is like my favorite, favorite feature for using VS Code, especially for embedded. So once again, I am in my Arduino Blinky file. And as you can see, there are lots of errors here because it says it is not defined. So I do want to point out to this issue on the VS Code Arduino because this is where I got my settings from. So let me go to my settings.json and I'm going to enable some of them based on this issue that I learned. So firstly, the browse path. The browse path has to be a bunch of folders that basically has that definitions. I've also declared the C standard, the compiler path, the CPP standard, as well as the include path, which is exactly the same as the browse path. I have also enabled the IntelliSense mode, the framework paths and tag parser. To be honest, the C++ settings JSON file, I did find it a little bit difficult. For example, what is the difference between include path and browse path? I tried to read it, but I am still having a little bit difficulty. Make sure you include tag parser as the browser engine. So I think I have enabled most of the C++ settings in my JSON file. So now when I come back to the INO file, notice that there are no more errors, but most importantly, Importantly, one of the Blinky examples, the variable that I always, always like to know is the LED Blinky. Where is this, uh, or rather what pin number is this uh, LED built-in variable? So now after I have enabled the settings, I can simply go to definition or maybe I can just hover over it. It's still loading because there are a lot of files. And yep, now you see the output is one. LED built-in is number 13. This is something I find very handy. So I know it's pin number 13. But most importantly, I can actually go to the definition and see the file where it is defined in. It is under Arduino app, Java hardware, Arduino AVR, and then pins Arduino.h. Similarly, let's uh, go to the serial.begin definition. So here it has found uh, three ways how the begin is uh, defined. It's inside hardware serial. And also when you start typing, let's say serial print or, or let's say even delay, where is it defined? So we will be able to trace exactly to the code and understand what the function is doing. Also notice when I do serial dot, let's say parse float parse int, they will also do some code hinting for me. So these folder parts that I have defined are by default to the Arduino. But what if I open another ecosystem of microcontrollers? So in this case, I am going to open the Blinky Pico, which comes with its own set of Pico SDK. So here, obviously, if I try to go to the definition, it will say no definition found because by default, it is looking at the Arduino folders, which is not correct. So what we can do is inside the individual workspace, we can create a specific VS code setting and we can call it C underscore CPP properties dot JSON. So of course we can go to the documentation once again and understand what are the various properties that we can include inside the new JSON that I'm going to override the default settings. I'm going to paste a bit of JSON that will say in this case, the include path should be the Pico SDK path as well as the the browse path. So it will completely override the default settings, which is pointing towards the Arduino files and folders. So now when I go to the Blinky Pico, I once again want to know what is GPIO out. So now when I right click and go to the definition, wonderful, it goes to the folder Pico SDK source host hardware GPIO. And yep, it is defined as one, which is incredibly helpful. You know, in the past, I I used to go to the GitHub or try to find where it is, but this is so much faster. Similarly, we can do the same with functions. What is GPIO in it? We can go to the definition and read more about it. 
The last example with IntelliSense that I want to do is also Arduino, but using Arduino and libraries. So this is a project that includes several libraries. As you can see at the top, there is not just Arduino.h, but there is also Adafruit related display and sensor libraries. So after I give it some time, notice that the Arduino.h and wire.h error goes away. That's because in my settings.json, I already have the path to the native Arduino libraries, but it cannot find the function definitions that come as part of the Adafruit sensor and the display libraries. So once again, we can do the same thing as a previous example. We can create a VS code folder in our workspace in that folder and create a CPP JSON file. And in this case, I am going to include the path, but this time the path is towards the Arduino libraries. And now when I go back to display sensors, notice that the errors are gone. But notice a funny thing about the errors, the Arduino and the wire.h errors are back. Well, let's solve them one by one. Let's solve the Adafruit GFX first. On my Mac, the libraries are installed in this folder. So obviously I do not have the GFX library, but I do have the sharp memory and the VML, the SI7021 libraries, as we can see here. But of course, I also use the Arduino CLI. So if I do a lib list, I should be able to see the same libraries here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to install the GFX library. So let's do a lib search and then GFX. And I'm going to grab it by name and maybe once again grip, grab it by Adafruit because there are plenty of them. Oops, let me try that one more time. And yep, I am going to install this library. Once again, notice how this has an error because obviously that library is not installed. So I'm going to install it and the error will be gone. So Arduino CLI lib install the Adafruit GFX library. All right, so once I installed inside the folder, I have a new library folder. And of course, if I do a lib list, the new library will be there. So now when I come back to the editor, I think I should give it a little bit time or maybe I need to restart the editor. I'm not so sure. All right. I restarted the editor and after a few seconds, because I think IntelliSense takes a little bit of time, the GFX Adafruit library error is gone. But notice how I still have the Arduino and the wire.h. And this is something that I do not know how to solve. If I do include the Arduino libraries folder here and let's say as part of the include path and make sure that all the libraries as well as the path to the native are available, I somehow will still have the error. So what I do is I will just leave out the Arduino libraries path here and I will replace it inside my workspace folder. So in this case, I will at least have the IntelliSense working for, let's say the display functions. Yep. It is clearly working. So if I go to definition for clear display, it is going on the documents Arduino library and then Adafruit sharp memory. However, this means that my native functions, for example, let's say delay or serial.print, there will be no definitions for that. All right. Tip number eight is all about autocomplete, but not in terms of functions. So here, what I'll do is I will enable the editor quick suggestions for comments, others, and string. Now I also have have this very, very useful extension called all autocomplete. So now, of course, if I want to write about delay, it will come up there because the delay is already here. Or let's say I want a digital write. Of course, read is also there because of IntelliSense. Let's say here I write blinking, the word blinking, and then I want to write the word blinking again. It will be enabled even if it is just a string. And the final tip that I have is SSH remote and I am using this extension. I find this very, very helpful for connecting to single board computers, totally headless. I do not need to connect a keyboard and a display to it. And it's very, very, very handy because you can be using this text editor that you have configured to your own settings. So once again, I am going to turn on the command palette and search for SSH remote. And here I will say connect to host. Of course, I have already configured it. So I'm going to connect to WavePy. And this is something uh, NanoPy that is sitting in my room connected to the network. So notice what happens. It will immediately start the server and connect to the WavePy. 
right? So let me open the folder. I'll just open home. And these are the files and folders that are found in that single board computer. So you can also activate the terminal here. And if you see, I am indeed on a Linux single board computer. Now, the cool thing is just like as if we are working in our own personalized, customized computer, we can create a file, say hello, and take advantage of all the settings we have, even if this file is residing on an external server. So hi from VS Code. So I quickly want to show you my SSH folder. It does have the private and the public keys for WavePy. And of course, using the SSH configuration, I have set it up as well so that it uses only the public and the private keys to log in and log off. So I am going to log in from my command line, not from the VS code. And yep, it is inside the terminal. So now when I list, all the files are seen here, including the file that I just created called hello. And if I cat hello, it says hello from VS code. Of course, I cannot use any of my bash aliases or anything because this is in the external server. But using VS code, I can do so many things. So I am going to just delete this and ls-al should not have any more hello. And I can simply go ahead and close the remote connection. All right, so I hope you will try out VS Code, especially if you are already using it for other programming languages. I at least found it a lot more coherent to not uh, jump to other text editors for my embedded projects. And uh, at the same time, like I said, don't beat up yourself, experiment, try out, uh, try out different settings. And I also have another podcast clip where the hosts are discussing about similar sentiments about command line tools and how it's okay to try out different stuff. Let's have a listen. The best way in general, you know, like there's all these tools are built around it, around other uh, other workflows, and it, it's kind of it would be kind of uh, audacious of me to think that oh I can, I'm going to come up with a better thing you know I'm going to customize my I really need this because I'm so high performance you know it's like that's not going to be the case. I mean, there's certainly reasons to stay in the command line world, but I, and it's great to have seen all that stuff, and I think I think it is valuable to go through that and say okay this is how this works just so you know what the things are if you do have to eventually look into it. Um, and there is no one right way. Of course, right. And if you can see as many different ways as possible, you can find a path that works best for you. Right. So I hope you found this video useful and uh, it's completely fine to try out and stumble upon things, but most importantly, have fun along the way. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.